Okay, so this is chapter two of the devil and commodity fetishism in South America. So chapter two is called the devil and commodity fetishism. So the first thing he says is the uh, devil only becomes, um, is only really invoked when rural people in South America become proletarian, pro proletarianized, like when they become the proletariat, when they're forced into, or where they, when they move into um, landless wage labor. So I thought this was quite interesting because it's, um, it's showing how when they're not working on their own land, they invoke the devil and uh, they believe he says it's only when they are proletarianized that the devil assumes such importance and no matter how poor and needy these peasants may be no matter how desirous they are of increasing production they uh, they don't invoke the devil in the normal circumstance I'm pretty sure it's that yeah however as the as the peasants work in their own land according to their own customs they do not do this so then he moves on to say that um, so it's quite interesting in the Indian peasants who work wage wages um, in tin mines in the Bolivian highlands have created work group rituals to their devil whom they regard as the true owner of the mine and the mineral and they do this it is said to maintain production to find rich ore bearing veins and reduce and to reduce accidents so it's quite interesting already that there's this sort of link between capitalism and the devil like this sort of link I have yet to see the commodity fetishism but um, maybe it'll be brought in soon so it then um, just goes into some more information about the um, the people in the areas that he studied for instance he points out that they have a political uh, militancy and a left-wing consciousness is quite high um, they uh, according to him the militancy of the Bolivian mine workers is legendary and um, they have a history of aggressive and skillful trade unions. However, he does state that um, prior to the recent, uh, that, that this used to be the case. So this was prior to recent oppression and reorganization of the workforce. So it's kind of sad to see that this has changed. Um, yeah, so there's that. Um, so then he, um, I believe, begins discussing the uh, theoretical implications. So he then says, um, is the devil belief associated with uh, as a, a response to like anxiety and haunted desire, like is this belief in the devil a um, a response to like not liking the situations they're put in? And it's quite interesting because then he says this interpretation links to the ideas put forth by Tyler and Fraser and Malinowski about the idea of magic as a pseudoscience, and it was invoked to relieve anxiety and frustration. When there was gaps in knowledge of the um, sort of unscientific of uh, the non-scientific world, so I think um, so. Like so, he says that this mode of interpretation is unacceptable because it presupposes that most of what needs explaining um, the rich, detailed motives and precise configuration of details and meaning but so it just sort of misses everything out it misses out the motives 
and the precise configuration of details and meanings that constitute their beliefs and the rights that we're looking at. So, um, God, this book is hard. I thought this was going to be easier. Um, so, then he again looks more into the theoretical implications. He talks about why magical beliefs are fascinating, not because they're ill-conceived instruments of the way the world works, but because they're poetic echoes that guide the uh, innermost course of the world. So what he's saying is that magical beliefs are fascinating to us because they are examples of the way that people understand the world. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we should uh, belittle them and do sort of what Tyler said and that they're uh, just, it just, they're invoked to relieve anxiety because they don't understand the world. It's more, they are interesting because it's how other people understand the world. So then, um, then he says, another plausible explanation for the devil beliefs is they form part of an egalitarian and social ethic that delegitimizes those persons who gain more money and power. So this is then following on from that and explaining how this understanding of the devil is is sort of is make is showing their understanding of the world. And also it has a use in that by inputting um, this by having this idea of the allegiance to the devil, it can impose would be entrepreneurs. It can stop people getting too engaged in claiming all the wealth. And he also um, quotes someone called George Foster, who says uh, that in these communities, that uh, things are finite, and the person who acquires more good things is, in effect, taking them away from people. So again, this sort of idea links to um, this devil worldview. Uh, then we have. So then he says, just as an explanation that reduces these beliefs to an emotion is defective, so any explanation that just reduces them to functions and uh, consequences tells us nothing about the metaphors and motives that the cultures have elaborated in response to their new cultural uh, social condition. So, so he's sort of said all of this and he's got us thinking about all these different ideas and then he begins to say that, um, that the, the plot thickens almost. It's not just about the function and the things that they do. He, I feel like he's saying that's an element, but then he begins to say, we also need to look at the fact that it's only the males that make devil contracts for production. And so in the, so again, linking back to the tin mine in Bolivia, the devil rights may well play a role in restraining competition and preventing entrepreneur, uh, would be entrepreneurs but a deeply complex issue should not be obscured to the point that these rights just refer to that. So, whew, hopefully that made some sort of sense. If I was to sum up these pages, I would say that what he's saying is the devil is only invoked when they're working in a capitalist, uh, labour-forced situation, and that we should look at um, this. See, this is interpretations, so we should interpret it in many different ways, and it's useful to look at it as its function. But it's also we need to be careful not to be like Fraser and um, Taylor and be 
and say that they're being unscientific and they do it for this reason and we can't focus too much on the idea of um, just the function and because it can get more complex than that and this is what I've got so far so hopefully that helps uh, some people and um, give me some honest feedback because I am quite tired and I admit I struggled with these uh, these pages if you'd prefer me to uh, just read it all through then I might make one video for that and I'm going to keep uploading these little videos because um, it actually helps me revise so they may just be for me but if anyone wants to watch them they can do so thanks for watching and uh, see you soon